um, uh, and we'll, we'll go ahead and get started, team. Um, I, I'll walk you through who, uh, who I am and who Chris is here in a minute, as well as what uh, content we, we felt would be worthwhile uh, to share today. And um, let's just get, go ahead and dive in and do that. Uh, first of all, uh, I run the, the overall data uh, protection and insider risk business at Forcepoint. I do that globally um, and, and have been doing that now for, for several years. Uh, Chris Puderbaugh, who's joined me on the phone um, or on the Zoom, I should say, is, um, is our, our field CTO. He has very deep background uh, in behavioral analytics, in particular, their use uh, within security programs uh, across data protection, insider threat, uh, fraud detection scenarios. Um, if anyone on this call has questions around how uh, how we've been successful in using behavioral analytics in a variety of environments, Chris is a great person to ask. And so don't hesitate uh, to put any questions in the chat. Uh, we're more than happy to, to leave time today. We almost certainly will have time later today uh, to answer all of those questions. And uh, Chris and I will, will be trading off uh, who's running the, the show here today. So we'll have some time ourselves to answer questions as they, uh, as they pop up. Uh, there's really no one on the planet that has, you know, more experience or uh, a more in-depth point of view on how to do this uh, with results than Chris. So I, I, I really encourage you to, uh, to ask him questions as we go. In terms of today's update um, or overview today, I will, I will give you a very brief overview on who Forcepoint is and, and what we've been up to now last several years. Uh, we'll talk about human behavior and, uh, and how it's leveraged most successfully with insider threat. Uh, or insider risk uh, scenarios. And then uh, Chris will take you through an innovation uh, that he and our engineering team have spurred on at Forcepoint, a, a very unique technology and conceptual approach to leveraging uh, what we call indicators of behavior. Um, and, and that'll be, I think that'll be really cool to, to look at together. And then finally, uh, we'll run a demonstration just to give you a sense of how our, our approach with indicators of behavior are leveraged by customers to get ahead of uh, the, um, the risk equation that we're all trying to, to solve for. So that's the plan for today. Like I said, we're casual. We're ready for any questions uh, that you have. Um, I, the, I recommend uh, typing them into the chat or into the Q&A uh, section, and we'll, we'll go ahead and cover them as they come in. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and, and get started with um, a quick update on what's been going on at Forcepoint and really what makes up our DNA. Um, a, a big part of the Forcepoint ecosystem is rooted in our our um, our, our former parent company, Raytheon, uh, where we did a lot of work in classified networks, uh, not only separating um, classified and unclassified data sharing and allowing that to happen, but also uh, we are the largest provider of insider threat capabilities uh, in the world because we support uh, so many government and now uh, financial services, uh, manufacturing and retail organizations with that capability. It's kind of the root and the, uh, the bones of, of where Forcepoint came from. We also added WebSense to our portfolio, as many of you probably know. Uh, we did that several years ago. We added uh, StoneSoft's firewall, which gave us a presence on the network side of of the enterprise, a very important element of the equation when you talk about end-to-end uh, -end visibility. We were on the endpoint, we're in the cloud uh, as a result of our CASB acquisition and we're certainly on the network. Uh, we bought, a, I mentioned we bought a, a CASB um, several years ago and uh, we also acquired Red Owl where Chris was, was also um, the head of, uh, of our analytics division and, um, and really spurred on a lot of the innovation that we made at, at Red Owl. And uh, those acquisitions really are what constitute to what is today uh, Forcepoint. And if you're not familiar with the company, um, I, I, you know, I would just say, look, we're, we're in this transition as a company from what has historically has been a, almost a, exclusively an on-prem uh, type of environment for security uh, to this the same thing our customers are going through. We're, we're at a hybrid cloud scenario at this point. I would say half of our portfolio is cloud native or running in the cloud and the other half is still on-prem. And so we're a very unique company that, that really embraces the hybrid cloud um, transition. We are, we are absolutely going to put all of our capabilities into a, a cloud native platform we're building. Uh, but at this point in time, we have a, a really nice and healthy mix of 
on-prem hybrid and cloud native capabilities. A lot of customers uh, across the world and all the verticals. Um, we're very big in government. We're very big in financial services, as you can imagine. And that kind of gives you a sense of who we are. The, um, the platform at Force Point is headed in this direction. So if you think about what we do uh, very specifically, we provide insider risk capabilities, again, government and financial services, manufacturing, our, prime, our, our manufacturing um, chip manufacturers, for example, and uh, retail, uh, as well as um, unique brands that have a lot of IP sensitivity and operate in, um, in some of the typical uh, nation state uh, threat scenarios. If, you're, if you manufacture, if you have IP and you want to protect it, but you manufacture in China, that's a very difficult problem because you're almost certainly uh, under, under uh, a constant threat of IP uh, theft when you're manufacturing in China. Uh, so we handle that for a lot of our customers and, um, and it's all about data protection in the end. If you know where the insider is, um, you should be able to do something about the control you have instrumented around the data. Whether the data resides and is worked on in the cloud, like in GitHub uh, for source code scenarios, uh, or just using Office 365 where we're collaborating uh, almost exclusively now today, um, wherever the data is, uh, if it's on the end endpoint, if it's in the data center, wherever it is, if you know you have an insider risk problem, you can't really do anything to mitigate that risk unless you have the control point to do something about it. As Chris once told me, um, behavioral analysis is only as good as the control point it can instrument as a result of the, the known risk. Something like that, Chris. I remember you saying to me several years ago. Close enough. Close enough. Um, it, it, and so there, there's there's so there's so much truth to that. And we'll get into what 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 good is visibility if you can't do anything about the action resulting in it. And that's so true in security in general. Um, so we're very proud to have um, the you know the world's largest and strongest insider risk business. Uh, paired very nicely with our data protection business. And you'll see uh, we are integrating the, those businesses together I'm, I'm under myself. So I'm in charge of that. Um, it's a, my, my responsibility. And then the, the last piece I'll cover here, uh, we completely understand and believe in the SASE and zero trust movements that are out in the market. There's no reason uh, we see that customers would go anywhere other than this approach to leveraging a hybrid cloud capability to route the user to their workload, whether it's in the data center or in a, in a cloud native application. And to do that with a common policy uh, that gets you out of having to build out uh, point solutions that protect the user in the branch, uh, in the data center and in the cloud. The point solution death um, by way of SASE and zero trust is something we, we wholly believe in. And, and we'll do that all together um, after the end of this year, we'll have everything on one endpoint uh, across all of these capabilities. And, and like I said earlier, uh, Forcepoint will very much look like a hybrid cloud company. We will, we will have plenty of on-prem uh, capabilities. In fact, we will always have a single agent uh, that will leverage uh, to, to drive a lot of our value. Um, and, and so this is what we'll look like by the end of this calendar year. So gives you a sense of the overall uh, Forcepoint point of view. Um, but you don't have to take it from me. Uh, we have a number of accolades that the analysts have given us. Um, we're, we're, we're on the right track when it comes to SASE, uh, when it comes to data protection. These are, these are cap capabilities that um, we've gotten great accolades from, uh, from the market on. So that's force point um, in, in a nutshell, if you will. I, I wanna now kind of pivot away from that and really get into the heart of the, the topic we joined uh, together for today. Um, and, and right up front, I just want to give the audience a sense of what we see uh, in the market today. Uh, it's sort of the, the trends, if you will, uh, that are, that are unique to the, the work from home or the remote work uh, scenario. Uh, first and foremost, a, a, um, a use case or a problem that's on the rise is negative behavior. Uh, now, historically, when Chris and I worked on projects in the past, negative behavior was usually a secondary use case uh, that was a nice to have scenario uh, within, our, within our customer's environment. Um, there were scenarios that you could imagine that were unlawful 
where unethical, um, which are just bad for your culture, that behavioral analysis will surface through communication analysis. Um, and, and that was sort of, like I said in the past, a secondary use case. That changed a lot in the last 18 months. Um, in particular, this, this last um, 2020 is when it started to really become a, uh, a more prominent use case for, uh, for us to, to uh, address with our clients. Um, beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, as, as companies started to make their transition to this remote work scenario uh, and layoffs, uh, rumors would swirl, all, all kinds of rumors would, sw uh, would swirl. Um, some companies handled the transition in a dubious uh, manner and uh, created a lot of ill will uh, with their employees. Things start to start to, to happen and they happen on the network. Um, they happen in chat. Uh, they'll happen in collaboration tools. Some, you know, some folks are so brazen uh, to, to talk about their, their um, sentiment around the company and the way they're handling things right on email. Um, and so as we pick those signals up, uh, we like to flag behavior risk uh, for our clients. And um, it's really one of those scenarios where the, the client needs to really think about what they want to do about it and how they want to do uh, what their what their action plan is uh, when when they see uh, collusion um, or collaboration around uh, the sentiment, the negative sentiment. So it's a big it's a big topic these days um, as users are going, you know, going off the network and um, have less you have less visibility into what they're doing and saying. Um, and ultimately, this this boils up to intent. That intent is something I'll come back to. Um, the second item that's becoming, well, the second item is probably one of our more, I don't know, Chris, you'd probably agree. This is probably one of our more mainstream use cases where um, the threat actor is constantly looking to break into the environment, but their main thing that they really want to do is, is take over a credential. Maybe share um, a scenario that, you, that you've had recently where, where this issue of compromised users was, was front and center. Yeah, so I mean, to your point, uh, a lot of the the final um, stages of the compromise user scenario uh, end up being data exfil. Um, people don't just break into networks for the sake of breaking into networks, right? There needs to be some type of end game. Um, so, like, if you think about it in terms of two potential end games for the most egregious scenarios, it's either I want to disrupt something or I want to take something, right? Both causing financial harm. Uh, but uh, us specializing in the I'm going to take something part, the data exfil. Uh, so there's elements of uh, compromise user that uh, you can definitely um, flag with some of the, the IOBs and analytics we're going to show you. Uh, but it's also very applicable to insider data loss as well, right? So removing the compromised user scenario part, if the person's already embedded, and this applies more to the negative behavior, uh, but they're already embedded in the environment, um, and then once the sealed data uh, for their own personal gain, um, we can see some of that activity or all that activity as well. Uh, so there's a lot of overlap between the two, but it's really just two different stories that are playing out. Yeah, and like, like, but like you said, um, the threat actors are, they're not looking to just, just break into the network and, and, right. and, and uh, map it. They want to get a credential so they can evade detection and, and ultimately, we all know, it all leads to the final use case, data exfiltration. Right. Whether that's source code design documents or other IP, the threat actor is breaking in and, and, and they're doing that whether they're um, compromising a user or they're doing it through convincing a user to do it for them. So the, the same thing, an insider is, is a, an external actor or an actual, you know, legitimate employee who's gone bad. You know, they look the same to us from a behavioral analysis perspective, because the end game is is this final scenario of of um, of stealing the data. Uh, and now that that's you know th that's a challenge that's become even more complicated in the work from home scenario because many you know many organizations did not have the infrastructure set up for users who were in call centers. It, it in many cases, you know, under surveillance, you know, down to the to the point where they had cameras on them at all times and had machines that didn't have uh, access to USB or didn't have access to printers in the in the call center and so on. These call centers uh, have employees that 
you know, typically go into the office um, and, and into the center and, and do their job from there and have access, of course, to client data. Um, in some cases, you know, extremely sensitive uh, client data. There's always going to be scenarios where, you know, a telco or a power provider, you can, you can come up with a, a multitude of scenarios, has a set of VIPs. And one of the, one of the classic use cases that we've encountered over the last, I'd say, few years is the call center employees that have access to the VIP data have often started to collude with one another and uh, take that data and sell it uh, to a variety of, of uh, buyers out in the gray or in the black market. You can imagine if you have Arnold Schwarzenegger's home address and contact details and other things that might be going on in his, in his house uh, because of your, you know, your affiliation, your company's affiliation with him, you're going, you're going to have some interesting juicy things to sell. And so um, that, that level of confidence that you have in locking down who does what with that data changed completely when the call center employee is now dialing in to that system that they used to, to log into on a terminal that was locked down. So if anybody on the, on the call today has um, encountered scenarios like that that they want to um, get our advice or challenge us with, uh, we would welcome it because um, it's a it's a complicated spot uh, that we've we've found great solutions for. Um, it's very much environment specific as well, so that's why I say if you if you've got any questions there, please please bring them to us. Um, okay, so that that gives you a sense of our trends that we're seeing in the market. Uh, let's let's move forward to our I guess our this is really our point of view, um, and and this is something that Chris and I have um, evolved over the, the the last I'd say eighteen months. Um, there are three legs to the overall data and insider risk equation. First and foremost, as we talked about earlier, gaining meaningful visibility into the user's interaction with data is critical, whether it's about data protection or it's about the visibility of insider risk, you have to have an understanding of how the user interacts with data. Um, and, and then it leads to analysis. But one of the things I mentioned in the prior slide was, was having visibility into the intent of the user. And so visibility, again, gives us an understanding of, of what the user's intent is. We also have uh, the need and the desire to analyze whether the user's uh, interactions are anomalous. Where, where are they abnormally behaving what are their behaviors that are abnormal or risky? Risky behavior is something that's pretty well defined uh, on a broad stroke. Every organization has some specific things, but you'll see that our approach takes um, a common denominator uh, approach to understanding behavior that's risk, uh, risky, I should say. Um, and this is a big, big part of the equation. If you, if you have visibility and then you can analyze that behavior um, between the user and the data, and you can do it in real time, we move away from the historical approach to security, which is all about events or alerts, alerts that need to be correlated, uh, alerts that need to be investigated, ultimately alerts that are false positives, for sure. We are always going to live uh, with a world of false positives when you try to design policies for scenarios that are either hypo hypothetical or happenstance. Um, that's, not a, that's not a very, you know, it's not a very pro, um, proactive way to handle your risk in your environment. Uh, so this is where behavioral analysis really becomes the new unit of measurement. Rather than risk um, that you have to anticipate, you receive the risk by analyzing it in real time. And we have a very specific way that we believe that should be done. I mentioned earlier that we have a single agent approach uh, to everything we do at Force Point, and that's uh, at the heart of our, our point of view as well. And then the last piece of the equation, as Chris uh, coached me years ago, um, you have if you have visibility and you have analysis, you understand the risk, so what? That so what is the thing that, that we figured out uh, here after 20 years of doing this, uh, we figured out here that 
that really solves for the overall risk equation. It does you no good to understand the risk and to analyze it if you can't do something about it in a meaningful time frame, as close to immediate as possible. Uh, so if, if I'm risky for data exfiltration or I'm risky for negative behavior, you want to let me do less with the data that I typically access, or let me do less with critical applications that house uh, the company's IP. If I'm if I'm a call center employee and I'm demonstrating really negative sentiment and I'm clearly leaving the organization, I should probably not have access to to the to the client data environment. It's a bad place for me to be able to snoop around over that you know over that period of time. That doesn't require a intervention by a, a human or an analyst. We know that, we know how to protect against that. We should do it in real time. And that's our force point uh, design control point integration with DLP, uh, as well as our, our, uh, our, our SWIG or our secure web gateway uh, capability. Uh, that's really the, the, the underpinning of our SASE uh, capabilities. And that gives you a sense of our overall uh, insider risk point of view. Chris, anything I left out there that you want to point out? Uh, we'll get into it later. I think the, the journey to action uh, is something that uh, has produced a lot of lessons learned, um, especially when we're talking about the compounding of different products. Um, it's not just as easy as making the decision that you're going to implement some type of action. There needs to be confidence there, uh, and we'll cover that uh, in the uh, coming slides. Yeah, it's a good point because, you know, um, when you're, we're going we're gonna to hand uh, the decision making over to a system, you have to believe in it. And, right. and you know, we, we know that you don't just go turn it on. Um, there's time and thought and tuning that goes into that, as you know. So that's a good point. We'll come to that in a minute. Um, this all goes back to uh, a couple fundamentals that, that we wholeheartedly believe in around behavioral analytics. Everything we're doing today in the world, for the most part, is reactive. If you look at where we live today, uh, we're over here on the right-hand side of the loss line. The loss line is in the middle of the screen. We're looking at the alerts after they have happened. It's kind of like crime scene investigation. We're looking at the clues and we're looking at the evidence and you know we're, we're able to look at all, all the indicators of compromise that happened after the fact. Um, that to me pains me. Um, because we know we can do better than that. And um, <laughs> you know, it's really what, what we're all about is, is taking behavioral analysis and using it to our advantage to become proactive instead of reactive. And we'll get into this, uh, this concept as, as I, I laid the foundation in the prior slides, you know, that visibility into that interaction and that analysis of the user's behavior in real time uh, when it's integrated with a control point in real time, we actually can get left of the loss. If we can see the risk coming down the pipe, we can change the way that that user uh, is treated in, in the environment in real time. That's this whole concept we have at force point of getting left of loss uh, on the left-hand side of the loss line. So um, that's all underpinned uh, by a, a new capability that we built and designed from, um, from scratch, really, at Forest Point. It's called Indicators of Behavior. Uh, Chris has been at the heart of this innovation, so he's going to take you through uh, exactly how we do behavioral analysis here at, at Forest Point. Thanks. Uh, so the previous slide uh, mentioned IOCs, right, Indicators of Compromise. And there's really two words that kind of differentiate uh, the classic approach versus what we've landed on. Um, first is threshold, right? So indicators of compromise. When I hear that, I think classic signatures where a threshold, a hard threshold is being set uh, and nothing happens unless that threshold is met. Uh, and that's not really a science, right? Like that's a lot of guessing. We can call it threat intel if we want. But that's going to vary from environment to environment. Um, so two problems are introduced with that approach. First of all, you might never cross that threshold as a risky user. Um, or if you do, it might be uh, so noisy to the point where it actually um, dehabilitates your ability to, uh, you know, triage incidents and actually work through stuff and find stuff. Um, so a couple of problems that came with that, and those are really just the, the high-level overview of that. But um, on the other hand, we have indicators of behavior, and that's our new approach here. 
And the word that's really associated with that is baseline. So how do I remove some of the, the, the um, you know, kind of the guessing game around setting thresholds uh, and make it more of a dynamic approach uh, that really adjusts to the user over time? Uh, so beneath each of these behaviors, IOBs uh, that you see here, uh, things like lever, data stockpiling, these are really kind of the atomic level indicators uh, that are then compounded uh, to produce a composite risk score. But each of these are assigned, uh, can be assigned a, uh, we'll call it like a starting risk point. Uh, and then from there, that risk point will actually adjust to the user's behavior. Um, so when you turn it on, it's not like you have to wait two weeks uh, to get results. Uh, you can get immediate results. Uh, if they're, you know, we'll call it, if they're a little chatty in terms of producing alerts, it will kind of normalize over time uh, as more activity is observed. Uh, and we do that by pushing out the computation of these IOBs to the endpoint itself. Uh, so, you know, from an architecture standpoint, if we're talking uh, uh, building baselines for things that are at this level uh, in terms of lever, data stockpiling, uh, there's a lot of resources required to do that. Uh, so that's one of the lessons learned from our previous approaches with UBVA was moving all this data to a centralized platform and trying to ask high fidelity uh, baseline questions uh, within a one location is not just, it's not very feasible. So we've moved all this calculation out to the endpoint. Uh, these baselines are built there, they're lightweight, uh, and then also uh, the action can be implemented directly where the, the computation is occurring on the endpoint. So next slide. So uh, yeah, the, the, the things like applied to Java, LinkedIn, Lever, that's just a, a single point uh, of risk, right? Um, a single IOB. Uh, and we're not saying you need to analyze, we'll call them 40 IOBs uh, individually by themselves, right? So these are actually rolled up into a composite risk score, uh, which you see some of the, the math going on here. Uh, and then if you think about it in terms of the kill chain of something like a data exfiltration incident, there's gonna be numerous things that occur even before the, the uh, act of exfiltrating uh, occurs. So um, things like you know, applying to a job on LinkedIn, pulling the files down from internal repositories, uh, playing with the files, looking them, at them, opening them, uh, encrypting them, maybe modifying them, zipping them, and then exfiltrating. So there's a lot of fun things to, to really hone in on before the actual exfiltration event occurs. Uh, and we can key off of that what we call precursor activity and build out a risk profile, uh, preventing the exfiltration event from potentially occurring uh, if there's enough data to, to really ratchet up that risk score. Uh, and then the other thing I mentioned is for these uh, risk scores, they're divvied out into risk levels. So like a, a one might be a zero through 20, two might be 20 through 40. You can actually edit the, the, uh, the buckets for that. But uh, when we start talking about automated action, um, the actions are uh, tied to those risk levels. So if you think about it in the context of DLP, a one might be do nothing, a two might be you know, audit, a three might be confirm, and then a five would be block. Uh, so you can actually observe uh, these baselines being built and then look at how they actually uh, impact the actions um, on the, the DLP endpoint. Next slide. So the other key thing that this is another lesson learned from our, our days of uh, UEBA, um, just because uh, there's a gap in data, right? Let's say that I uh, went on vacation for a week or something like that. Uh, that does not mean it's a fresh start for me. Uh, it might be refreshing, but it's not a fresh start in terms of behavior. Uh, so how do we preserve some of the more egregious activity for a period of time uh, after we observe it? Uh, and that's what we do with risk score decay. And these are actually assigned on the IOB level, not just the composite level. So uh, if you are uploading more stuff to personal cloud, uh, and let's say that the risk score for that IOB is an 80, uh, depending on that risk score decay option, uh, we can say, okay, hang out here for at 80 for two weeks or slowly decay uh, or uh, you know, kind of tear it off uh, week after week or day after day. Uh, and from this adds a really a high level of fidelity when we're bundling all these IOBs up into a composite risk score. If you think about it, we showed you a couple of five, like a lever, the stockpiling and all that. All those have decay functions that are tied to that specific IOB. Uh, so as those are updated day after day after day, that composite risk score also reflects some of the elements that we're showing you here with the risk score decay. 
one of the things I think that we should point out, Chris, as we go back um, to the approach here that that we've learned, we've 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 learned from our mistakes is essentially what we're trying to get across with with this uh, overview of IOBs. Um, this this framework that we've we've built out here, the lever, the stockpiler, the data exfiltration actions, the data access, these system modifications. These are things that we built out of the box. And one of the reasons we've done that is we see so much commonality across environments around these types of behaviors. We know the risk. We understand the risk um, ex ex excessively well. We've seen it in many environments and we've normalized how we, how we surface risk around it. But that's one of the basic fundamentals. The, I think the more advanced fundamental that we've uncovered is the speed to baselining. Instead of taking six months to baseline an organization, because this analysis happens at the endpoint in real time and, and is fed into a cloud environment, we can finish baselining, baselining in 30 days or less uh, and really can do that across an organization of five users to five million users. It's, 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 it, from our perspective, it's infinite scale either way because these things come and fire out of the box. We don't have to do any of the old UEBA work where we had to get the logs, get the logs into the analyst uh, engine or the analysis engine, tune the analysis, and then check it with our customer. That's what UEBA looks like. That's the hard fact uh, of the matter is there's several steps you've got to complete and you've got to have that completed cycle of steps stay reliable, if you will. Getting the logs, getting the logs into the analyst engine and then producing risk scores uh, is a lot of work. Um, and obviously it's worthwhile if you can mitigate risk when you do it well. We just felt like it took too much time and uh, was fraught with, with many areas where you can make mistakes and the, the mistakes mean that the risk scores are lower fidelity. Um, so that's why I think it's very important, Chris, to point out these things come out of the box. Um, this is how we do the calculation. And then ultimately, this is how we make sure that the calculation isn't static over time. And that gives us the ability to baseline quickly and get the client to a point where they can actually start instrumenting controls based on risk in 30 days. Uh, some take 60 if they want, you know, just that longer period of time. But I, I don't know, Chris, anything else to add there? Yeah, so just to kind of put another thing on top of that is we're not trying to be the official adjudicator for what's bad globally. Um, we want to build a framework and let the user's uh, behavior and activity determine the scores, right, via baselining. Uh, so I think that's the, all, the other key differentiator uh, is a lot of times when you hear vendors talk about, well, we've done a ton of work in terms of threat intel uh, and then uh, building the stuff out in labs and all that. It still ties back to that uh, classical approach where it's just a threshold that's being set and saying, this activity is worth 75. And we're saying, well, no, like actually the user's behavior uh, and baseline will determine how bad that is for the user. Uh, and that's a key differentiator for us. Definitely, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you pointed out because I'm, I'm not trying to say we know everything. Um, <laughs> we, we just, we know enough that we can give you out of the box a, a lot of value. And then as you go, whether your your you know whether, whatever your vertical is you're gonna and your environment looks like you're gonna want to be able to tune and, and opt out for example of some of the behaviors um, you may have compliance reasons why you don't want to look at people looking for jobs there's plenty of ways that you can tune things uh, anyway I, I, I want to get to the demonstration before we do that um, Chris why don't, why don't we talk about you know these these two standalone solutions becoming one. Yeah, so these are, when we talked about the journey, the path towards uh, our, our current approach, these are the stops in the road. Um, we still offer these stops, like if you really if you really have a use case that uh, requires, let's say, UAM only or UBA only, so be it. But uh, we've taken the lessons learned and really just cherry pick the, our favorite attributes for these uh, technologies, UAM and its uh, you know, vast collection capability, its rich data that it produces. Uh, and then UEBA, its ability to add context uh, to uh, you know high volume data, uh, uh, data that would be overwhelming to just a you know a single uh, analyst looking at it day to day, um, and we've compounded this into our current solution DUP, 
and really packaged it nicely uh, and reduced a lot of the maintenance required and the overhead in terms of deploying it, uh, managing it on a day-to-day basis. Uh, and then also to, to our original value add there, um, you know, aligning it with cloud first and then uh, you know, really bringing it, introducing this uh, really uh, powerful endpoint that enables uh, reduced mean time detection and mean time to respond. So that's when we talk about converged capabilities, it's really just taken our, our favorite uh, attributes from the technologies that we've worked with and developed in the past. Uh, and those are the lessons learned here. Um, we're going to show you um, how that works and, and um, we'll, we'll uh, try to kind of uh, get your, your feedback as we go here. And remember, if you have any questions for us, please just go ahead and um, fire them off in the, in the chat and um, we'll, we'll respond as we go. What we're going to show next is is illustrated here in a timeline where a user's behavior escalates over time. I'm going to pick it up right around here um, after the 30 days where it decayed. So um, what you'll see is um, you, you'll see that our DLP product and our behavioral analysis product, dynamic user protection, works. They work together to provide us the visibility and analysis, and then ultimately the action. Uh, associated with a risky user and do that all in real time. And that one of the things I want to point out here is um, anybody who's familiar with DLP tools knows that there are multiple ways to, uh, to address a, a user in terms of their risk. You can block them. Um, you can encrypt the data they're sending via email or USB or whatever mechanism they're, they're doing exfiltration through. Um, you can also do um, real-time challenge response or, or confirms uh, before a user takes an action. And so you'll see um, we're, we're going to go straight to a scenario where the user gets blocked. Uh, but we very rarely, if ever, recommend that approach. Uh, blocking is, is, a, you know, is obviously a very disruptive decision. And so you have to be stone cold, 100% sure that the user is malicious or has been compromised. And they are absolutely um, with ill intent uh, exfiltrating your data. Uh, so that's the last, last line of defense is the way we kind of think of that. You'll see that here in a minute. Okay. Uh, Hello. I feel we have a question from Juan Bicario. Sure. Um, here it goes. As a data protection officer consultant, I use GRC software to mitigate risks for compliance with international standards laws and regulations. Although those risks are for the implementing controls, how would you use this application to bring value to the organization and can be translated when mitigating the overall risks for compliance with standards, laws, and regulation? Thank you very much, Juan, for your question. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so we have customers that do, it exact, do exactly that. Um, when you think about compliance or regula regulatory um, you know, meeting regulatory uh, mandates. Uh, obviously, you have to. Everybody has to figure out where they want to be on that scale of compliant. Um, now, most of that is done manually today. I'm sure, that as the person asking the question knows, most of what you do to meet and achieve compliance is done in a manual fashion, especially the reporting aspect of it. Um, in order to ensure that you're compliant with, with whatever regulation that you're responding to. I think one of the, the, the basic things that we, we believe behavioral analysis does for you is give you the ability to take action where a user is risky and stop that user from potentially uh, breaking a rule that would put you out of compliance. For example, if you look at GDPR, and some of the, the requirements within that, that standard uh, and that, that, that um, pressure that comes with that standard on European banks um, and the fines or European organizations in general, the fines that come with it. If you see somebody's manipulating customer or employee data and is stealing and or is stealing it and we stop that, that's a regulatory compliance moment that we we're, we we're able to instrument. That's the best example I can give you. And, and that's what a lot of our customers have pinpointed that as a, as a typical scenario where they're able to achieve that without having to do it manually, right? There's not, a, there's not an army of analysts that are required 
to instrument that control. Okay, Phil, uh, we have a couple of questions more. I think this is the right time to take it, right? Go for it. Yeah, I'm going to do a demo if we have time, but but questions mm -hmm. are better than a demo. Yeah, great, great. This is a previous uh, questions that uh, Gentle, Gentle London made us via WhatsApp. Uh, we, we've been talking about this, but um, this is the question. Uh, as many employees are not required uh, to work remotely from home due to the pandemic, what can companies do to protect their confidential data? So can, can you please give us uh, more context, perhaps an, an example on how to approach this? Well, um, that's a big topic. Um, so here's what we see customers doing uh, right now. So some customers are issuing um, new machines. And so the call center employee or the employee at the branch is now, now not going into the office. And so they're now, um, in order to make them compliant with their, their access standards to the data center or the, or the applications they need to do a job with, um, they're issuing new machines. So that's expensive. And um, it's a fact of life in a lot of uh, scenarios where, where we're operating. Um, the other way that, uh, that people are solving for that, for, for folks that didn't have laptops or didn't have machines at home, uh, or virtual desktop um, issuance of, of virtual desktops. It doesn't matter what the form factor is in the end. They've got to get that user to their workloads in a way they're confident uh, that they, they can be productive. And then, of course, this is the question of security. And so, so everything we talked about and everything I'm about to demonstrate shows you exactly what you can be you know, thinking of in terms of the visibility, the analysis, and then that finally that action. One of the biggest problems right now with um, people moving to work from home is if they wanna take your data, a lot of them feel like they can, they can go offline. So they disconnect the VPN. They think they're outside your purview of your security controls and they start to print all your sensitive data. They just think, hey, there's no way they're watching me print this to my home machine. Nope, we got you. We'll get you. <laughs> we can we can see that and we can stop that uh, from happening. So um, more on that as we go. Uh, any other questions, Juan? Yeah, and last one. Uh, this is an internal question. Uh, regarding risks and human behavior analysis, uh, who should be the responsible within the companies? Who should be accountable for taking the first step and address the situation? Ah, good question for Chris. Um, I think you know he's the expert in this category, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it over Chris to you, and I'm gonna get the demo ready. So the it's a good question that's come up with a lot of our our research, right? Like um, especially when we're talking about uh, potentially scenarios where there was unintentional uh, leakage of data. Uh, so who owns that that risk and who owns that uh, you know not once I won't say fault but uh, where's that uh, that uh, the ownership of that lie? I think a lot of that still needs to uh, fall on the company uh, itself and because I think there's some basic uh, we'll call it uh, control hygiene that could be implemented uh, that is not implemented in a lot of cases uh, and that kind of ties back to some of the reluctance to, get to a state like things like a blocking state or something like that. There's just a lack of confidence in some of these technologies that we're seeing. Uh, so I don't necessarily think that, uh, you know, that we can say it's just, you know, users are getting smarter and uh, a little bit more uh, risky. Uh, I think that the companies are just slowly starting to, to realize that uh, there's underutilized technologies within their portfolio. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, look, the, the, the there's um, a number of schools of thought on this topic. Um, first of all, that if there's a if there's a chief risk officer, that's often a good spot for us to start with. If there's an insider risk program, we start there. Obviously, a data protection program where we're, we're very uh, comfortable and common. It's common for us to start there. Chief risk officer positions um, are more and more common in companies now. And more and more often, they are the place that is getting the budget to do this type of, of work with behavioral analysis. Um, they are more often than not very, very tightly linked uh, to HR and legal and the business, you know, as well, because it's all, it all, it all kind of boils down to 
how much you want to invest in mitigating the risk that you're you're accepting today. There's some level of acceptable risk that our companies deal with today. Forcepoint, for example, knows how much risk we have related to the controls and the value of our IP. Our value of our IP is what we're worth in the market. If somebody steals our source code for all of our products, probably worth several billion dollars. So what are we doing to put countermeasures in place for that is, is all under the purview at our company uh, under the CISO. Um, there's no question that it's the chief information security officer at Forcepoint. Uh, when it comes to a bank, for example, the chief risk officer is typically responsible for modeling out what kind of risk is acceptable in, uh, in each business. And that has a float, as many of you know, that float is what's acceptable. Um, and they're always looking for ways to offset that risk. And, and, and so more and more often, we're finding that our, we are at the center of those types of discussions. And one of, the, one of the discussions I had just last week with a pharmaceutical organization was, was spurned on by this demo. And, and with just, I just wanna do this with, with about 10 minutes left, I wanna walk you through how this feels if you're a user that is demonstrating risk or intent uh, to steal data. So if you look at this, this sheet in front of you, uh, this is a user, I'll take you through the journey here, um, who's looking at some very sensitive IP. And if you follow in the right-hand corner, there's a uh, iMessage comes in and it's a friend of his that is, is letting him know there's a new job uh, for him to check out. And so was, once that user starts to discuss, um, or sorry, when the user starts to look at the job, this is where indicators of behavior um, start to pick up the user's risk. So as soon as that user clicked on apply for the job, um, saved it, those sorts of things, we're picking that up and we're assessing that user's intent and flagging it for risky behavior while it's happening. So this is all happening on the user's endpoint without, without them knowing, of course, They're, we're, we're picking up these, these indicators of behavior. Um, this is a big signal. So when you let recruiters know that you're open to opportunities and as you can see here, uh, sends back a chat to his friend uh, that he's applied for the job. These are all things that are telling us this person is almost certainly going to leave the organization. And when leavers are leaving, they start to do things to evade defense and they start to stockpile data. They start to get their go bag, if you will. And if, as you see here, he's, um, he's in a Zoom meeting, uh, working and collaborating on this very sensitive analytic framework that Chris actually built. And um, he's, he's taking a screenshot of that data. He thinks that we are not gonna be able to pick that up because we're, we're um, we're not sitting there and, and watch, looking over uh, the user's shoulder, but we actually are. So we see that he's picked up the screenshot and we see that he moves that data to a file called GoBag and drops from the meeting, looks at the GoBag. As you can see here, those screenshots are inside the GoBag now. That's our sensitive IP gone into a file on his desktop. And it gets, it gets more interesting now as as Kunal, the user, uh, goes ahead and manipulates the file, zipping it. These are all indicators that something is, is happening or something is wrong with the user. Now, when the user goes and turns the Wi-Fi off, they think they've fully evaded our visibility. They're now off the network. They're no, there's no VPN, there's no direct connect uh, access to to the corporate network or the, in, in the user's mind, no access to the security controls that are outside the purview of the organization. And here's where the user uh, starts to deliberately try to exfiltrate the data. Um, here's the mounted USB, USB um, attempt to move the files to the USB is blocked. Now this is that final leg of the equation I talked about earlier where we're taking action in real time. We picked up all the risky behavior on the network and off the network, and we took action immediately. Uh, it gets 
it gets more interesting to a, to a certain extent. Um, Kunal realizes he can't do this um, off the network or with his, with his USB. So he immediately thinks, okay, I'll, I'll go back on the network uh, or on to a network. And then I will try to pull it into to Dropbox. And the same action, of course, is gonna apply here. Uh, we're not gonna let Kunal uh, move that, that data. That's our, our company's data. We're not gonna let it move anywhere. And so you can see the same block is instrumented here uh, because of, 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 of the risk score that Kunal has. We'll show you what this looks like now from a, from a perspective of our, our analyst dashboard. You'll see Kunal's um, risk score here is 97. That's definitely in the zone where you don't have to worry about instrumenting a, a false positive block. That's a, that's a fire and block for sure. There are many other scenarios prior to that we could have confirmed or we could have encrypted uh, the, the data and let it go out um, if you wanted to. There's so many different ways to, to handle that risk. But the, the story, uh, the storyline behind the block that happened on Kunal is all here in the dashboard along with the forensics uh, that back it up. And so, you know, while this is useful after the fact, if you need to have a confrontation with the employee, it's really just proving the value and the, the um, not the value, but actually proving the efficacy of the decision that we instrumented with the controls that we, we, we deploy. So th this is all gives you the sense of, of what we're capable of behind the scenes. You have the forensics and you have the data to report on how many risky users you have in your organization, uh, what you're doing about them, trends and all that sort of thing. It's all after the fact and the real, the real value of it, behavioral analysis is, is being able to instrument the control that mitigates the risk so you don't have to accept it. Back to that original thought that we had around overall risk mitigation. So that's, that's a quick demonstration of how we do things today uh, at Forest Point. That's a, our behavioral analysis tool. Uh, in action. So Juan, I, I wanted to give a few minutes back to you and the team for anything else you wanted to, to follow up on. I've got that final slide here for, for yeah, everyone please. in terms of global tech as well. Yeah, please. So thank you very much uh, to everyone for being here. Um, please let me know if you can see my face. Yeah, yeah. I think you can see my face. Okay. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, we've been organizing this kind of events uh, for Force Point. We are global tech security. We are a Colombian company. Uh, we are a security Colombian company with more than 26 years on the security information market. So if you have any questions, you want to keep conversation, uh, you have, uh, you want to have a conversation regarding information security, we have uh, plenty of uh, experience regarding Force Point solutions. And please, uh, let, just let us know, just let us know. We have different clients throughout the Caribbean. We have clients in Jamaica, we have clients in Barbados, Curaçao, Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago, and in Colombia and Latin America as well. So uh, just please let us know. Uh, if you have any further questions, just you can, you can write Ana Maria, you can write uh, Pedro, have a note.